one night we'd had dinner at right, you know, sitting right here. And they started asking again about how did daddy die? Jim had already gotten up from the table and I said, you know, Jim, I think you need to come and sit back down because I just think it's time. Six years ago, Jim Gray and Sandy Tabor Gray lost their son, Michael, to a heroin overdose. His death was as devastating as you'd imagine, made all the more so because Michael left behind two small children, twins, too young to understand what had happened to their dad. With the twins' mother out of the picture, Jim and Sandy re-entered the world of young kid parenthood, something they never expected to do this late in life. In stories of addiction, much as with any disease, we often talk about prevention or the shock and tragedy of someone's death. We fade to black at the funeral, Roll credits. But this is a story of the aftermath, about those left to live on once the unthinkable has happened, and about how Jim and Sandy responded when the twins began asking difficult questions about their dad, his death, and all that came before. From Capital Broadcasting and WREL Documentary, this is the WREL Doc Podcast. I'm Cliff Baumgartner. We first told the story of Michael Tabor Gray and his family a few years ago in the WREL original documentary, Searching for a Fix. But if you missed that doc, no worries. We just released an updated version called Finding a Fix, which you can watch for free right now on our YouTube page. Just search WREL Documentary on YouTube and I'm sure you'll find it. Finding a Fix tells personal stories of opioid addiction and covers the steps North Carolina is taking to combat this tragic epidemic. It's a big, complicated, and incredibly important topic, so I hope you'll give the doc a watch. It's worth your time. Michael's story in particular, which is full of a lot more detail than we can get into in this episode. But for our purposes today, I'll let his mom, Sandy, tell you the main points. Michael was, um, he was our oldest, and we have two other children, another son, and a, our daughter's the youngest. Um, he was a fun kid. Nothing, nothing foreshadowed what was coming for his life. Um, you know, had a lot of friends, good in school, loved to play soccer, um, loved the lake. So just a lot of, you know, love for life. Um, and... We're not exactly sure what came first. We know that he had broken his arm when he was about 15 and experienced opiates then as well as uh, with um, having his wisdom teeth out. And of course, back then they were prescribing a lot more than what they prescribe now. Uh, But that was a part of what led him down the journey of um, opiates. We did not realize all that was going on for a couple years. Sandy and Jim each have their own history with addiction. So when they saw what was happening with Michael, they knew what needed to be done. They took Michael to treatment. And it's there he met the woman who would ultimately become the mother of his kids. He became a father before he was even 19 with twins, um, which just caused a lot of stress in his life. Uh, He also lived in another state. So we did not realize all that was continuing to go on until he came back, uh, which was in 2012. And I believe it was then that he turned to heroin um, out of the cost, primarily. Um, A lot of friends were doing it here, though. Michael went back into treatment in 2013, this time for heroin addiction. But soon, things started looking up. After treatment, he moved into a sober living home in Asheville, and on the weekends, he'd make the trip back home to see his parents and the kids, who were only two and a half at the time. It's during one of these visits, though, that the Gray's world changed for good. We'd been together all day long. He'd been, he was home for a visit. He was with his kids all day. Uh, everything seemed to be great. Um, and it was that next morning when we found him overdosed up in his bedroom. With Michael gone and the twins' mother facing her own struggles, the responsibility of raising the kids fell to Sandy and Jim. Yes, we're totally thrown back into um, raising young children, which really our kids are all, you know, grown and working. And so it's... Not how I expected to spend my retirement years. 
And if the usual stress and rigmarole of raising kids wasn't enough, for Sammy and Jim, there was a cloud hanging over everything, an elephant in the corner of the room. Sooner or later, the twins would want to know more about how their dad died. They'd have questions, and they'd deserve answers. And as Jim points out, there's no handbook for how to handle that conversation. I don't think you can prepare for it. I think I remember the, the, the best conversation that I had, and we had, and I can hopefully speak for, for Sandy, is that we met with our, our pastor probably within the first week, 10 days after. Um, and <sighs> ironically, she had lost a son. So she was very familiar with you know the loss of a child, and uh, so we, we we could talk openly about that, and uh, um, and we asked that question, and uh, and everybody that we've talked to has said really, it's the the children will begin to ask questions. You know we don't need to explain anything until they start asking questions, and that has proven to be very very true, and and it's amazing how those questions just come up naturally you know, for, for their little minds as they begin to develop and, 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 get, uh, and get older. And our, you know, our, our philosophy is honesty. I mean, it's just to be as, uh, as honest as we possibly can, uh, age appropriate, appropriately for, for the children. And as they've gotten older and their questions have gotten more complex, you know, we be able to share more information. Well, for one, they were with us. They were with me when I walked into Michael's room. So, um, they realized that I couldn't get him breathing, so they were a witness to all of that. But at that time, it was, you know, they would say to me, Nana, you couldn't get Daddy to wake up. You couldn't get Daddy to wake up. And we would say, yes. And how we explained it was that Daddy was sick and that his body just quit working, which was all true, you know, but they weren't ready to hear about drugs and addiction, and they couldn't have comprehended any of that. But what we were finding in school was that there were other kids that maybe had lost a parent, but it was um, primarily cancer. And so those were the questions. Did daddy have cancer? Did daddy have cancer? And we were able for a good year or so kind of just continue to answer with um, you know, well, it wasn't cancer, but your daddy did have a disease and he was sick. And then eventually the day came. One night we'd had dinner at right, you know, sitting right here. And they started asking again about how did daddy die? You know, how did daddy die? And of course there's two of them, so, <laughs> so they're not really letting up. And um, Jim had already gotten up from the table and I said, you know, Jim, I think you need to come and sit back down because I just think it's time. Well, I started by trying to explain addiction and what I thought they could understand as far as um, starting with something thinking it was, you know, whether a friend had given it to him or it was something he, um, I think I did bring in that a doctor had prescribed in the beginning and that some people are different, their bodies handle it different, and it was something that he... Um, really liked and his body wanted more of. And, um, and from there, he lost that power of choice. And the kids, understandably, didn't take it well. I was surprised for as simple as I kept it. You know, this was a couple years after Michael had died, so I really wasn't expecting like this big emotional upheaval because we'd already had been going through the death of their dad. And I don't want to say we'd been through it because it was still ongoing, it's still ongoing today, but I just didn't expect the complete fallout that came at the table that night. Um, and it was as if they really understood the gravity of Michael's disease and what, what had happened. And of course, going back to you know their age, it was like, why would he do that? Why would he choose to do that and, um, and leave us? So it always comes back to them um, because that's what, you know, heck, 
that can happen with adults, you know, so, you know, that it always comes back to why would you do this to me? But that's, you know, that's how they saw it. Like, they understood that it was a choice, but yet I was trying to explain the addiction part of it too. Um, and of course, that's a conversation that was not a one and done. That's just a, an ongoing kind of explanation. And Sandy says the twin's grief It comes out in ways big and small. And sometimes it isn't the way their dad died that impacts them the most, but just the simple fact that he's not there. You don't realize, especially once a child becomes school age, how much they are learning just in their environment. And as cognitively their brains develop, what all they're willing to grasp and the reality of their situation And probably the biggest thing we see right now is the reality that they realize that their parents are not in their lives. And people are always quick to say, oh my gosh, they have you, you're great, which is wonderful. I mean, we, I think we do a wonderful job and I'm grateful that we're there for them, but we are not their mom and dad. And And they know that. And they know that. Um, And they know they're different from other kids in school. And and that's what I was going to say. Yeah, Yeah, that's that's very recognizable. Parents are coming in, volunteering in the classrooms, having lunch. Um, And even if I do that and, you know, and I do do that and he goes in, we're the grandparents. Um, And then the questions come, you know, where's your mom? Where's your dad? You know, how come your mom's not here? So it's that kind of stuff. Talking to Jim and Sandy, I got the feeling that as difficult as telling the twins was and has continued to be, there's some relief in no longer having that particular storm cloud looming over their heads. But of course, now they have to look to the future, at how all of this will follow the kids as they grow up, both in others' eyes and their own. You know, after we told them, we didn't think, of course, I I thought about the repercussions of... um, who you let know this information because there's such a stigma out there and so much judgment about it. Um, Now, people that know us know that we're good people, but people that don't know us and, you know, are just meeting the twins in school um, and they hear that a parent has overdosed and died that kind of separates them out, especially in another adult's eyes. Um, And in the beginning, especially Aiden, he would just blurt that out. We'd be in a restaurant and he would say in a very loud voice, well, if my dad wouldn't have OD'd and taken drugs, and I'd be like, (laughs) he was angry, you know? Um, And so then you're having the conversation of not where you want I'm not telling him to keep it a secret because that's where a lot of the problem lies is keeping it a secret. And we've never done that. But that there were good people to share that with, trustworthy people, people you could trust with that information. And then there was a time not to share specifics. Now that is hard for a young child to understand. You know, and we've talked about who would be a trustworthy person, your teachers, you know, friends at church. There's no doubt that as they get older, the kids have a lot to process, a lot to learn. But this experience, it isn't any easier on the grown-ups. After the break, how are Sandy and Jim handling their new lives as sudden parents? And how do you mourn the loss of your child while staying strong for the children who are mourning him too? And in the beginning, um, There were moments when I would think, I just want to grieve my son. For decades, Capital Broadcasting has been on your TV, radio, and computer with our signature coverage of news, weather, and sports, not to mention original documentaries and even the best advice on what to do in town this weekend. And now you can get all the great content you expect from us, plus a ton of brand new shows anywhere, anytime on the Capital Broadcasting Podcast Network. Listen to the WRAL Doc Podcast, 919 Beer, Out and About, Tech on Tap, or WRAL News Daily. And yes, they really do post new episodes five times a day. 
Whether you're looking for politics with The Wrap or sports with Kane's Corner and the best of Adam and Joe, you're sure to find something to help you while away your morning commute or that afternoon run. Every CBC show is available on your favorite podcast app, or you can go to WREL.com and search podcast to see them all in one place. Listen today. So in the aftermath of Michael's death, Jim and Sandy went from loving and supportive grandparents to, surprise, full-time mom and dad. And they say the effect that's had on them, on their grieving process, and even their marriage, it's been a lot. You know, I love my grandchildren, but it's not what I would choose to be doing um, if circumstances were different. And in the beginning, um, there were moments when I would think, I just want to grieve my son. You know, I don't want to have to exert all this other energy and always be thinking about what is best for them, what can I do to help them. Um, And then I would tell myself, well, that's a selfish way to think. You know, you do this for your son kind of thing. But um, it definitely hinders. Like, I just feel like, Well, or it could help because I do think I had a place to put my energy, you know. I mean, I had to get up every morning. You know, couldn't stay in bed. So um, in that sense, it was good. But then there was another part that I, that feeling of exhaustion um, mentally, not from taking care of, but just mentally always thinking about how, what was best, how was I going to get this done, um, the strain it put on our relationship, the strain it put on my other two children. It was a, um, I mean, that's not even something that is still done. Like all of those relationships are strained. It's definitely different. I mean, it, it changes every aspect of your life. And, I, and going back to that first conversation you know, with, with our pastor, um, you know, she shared that you know, statistically, you know, when parents lose a sibling, 50, or a child. Or lo- I'm sorry, yeah, lose a child, um, 50% of the time it ends in divorce. You know, and, that, uh, and that shocked me too. And at the time it's like, well, you know, it's not gonna happen to us, we're rock solid. You know, and that's, uh, but it has put a strain on our marriage. You know, it, re- it really has, and there's been it, it's been rocking. It's it, it surprised me in one sense, but then I keep remembering that conversation that this is normal. You know, it's not unusual for for that to happen. I don't know why. I can't put my finger on it. Um, you know, that's still a lot of. You know, I'm still seeking some counseling for um, for the grieving of of, of of my son and. You know, what's going on in my relationship with my marriage? You know, so it's it's really had a big impact on that. And I think the biggest thing I would share is just to be open and honest and communicate. You know, I find that nine out of ten times when I have a situation and it gets to the point where I just want to explode, it's because I haven't communicated to Sandy or to the kids or to whoever it is, but just the more I communicate and the more I let people know how I'm feeling, what's going on, and then I can get it out in the open and talk about it. And they say that as much as the kids are experiencing the pain of a life unlike what everyone else has, Sandy and Jim, they're going through that too. So much, I think, you know, for the strain of a marriage is that you are, you know, we're both heading into retirement years, but we are far from retiring, like, you know, and so all of our friends, though, are in those years, and they're, you know, traveling with their spouses, or, you know, kids are all gone out of the house, so they're going here and going there, and just, and we have been, you know, catapulted back 20 years, and, You know, if we want to go out of the house, we need to have a babysitter. If we want to, you know, just that whole, so, you know, our life has been robbed, you know, in a sense. Um, And I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm complaining because I'm, Mm. I'm not. No, resentful about that. Yeah, we love our, our grandkids and we wouldn't do it any other way. We know it's the right thing to do. But you ask the question and the reality is, is that, 
you know, we are living a very different life from everybody else in our our community. In our community, in our group. And you find yourself in this precarious situation because all of my grandkids' parents are 20 plus years younger than I am. So they're doing things and they're not thinking to invite me because I'm the grandmother, mm-hmm. you know? And, but yet my grandkids need friends. Um, and so I'm seeking out that, but I'm, I'm, I'm a different generation. So, you know, I don't really fit in with what my friends are doing because I have two young children, but I don't fit in with the age group of my grandkids' uh, friends. So oftentimes it's another part of that isolation. The disease of addiction is an isolating disease. Well, in some ways it continues on. If you met the Gray family today, you wouldn't have any idea what they've been through, what they're going through. They're kind, warm, funny people. The kids are polite and adorable. While we were there, they showed us their school pet on temporary summer loan to the Gray household. It's a rabbit named Sir Ulrich von Lichtenstein, which, yes, is a reference to the movie A Knight's Tale, for those in the know. But once the kids left, the topic turned, maybe inevitably, to Heath Ledger, who starred in that movie and died as a result of his own struggles with drugs. Conversations like this, they happen all the time now. Stories like Heath's or Michael's are all too common. We hear them on the news or from friends, but the emphasis, understandably, is almost always on the addict. And typically, they only end one of two ways. But the truth is, whether tragic or inspiring, the story always goes on. And that's not an easy thing to talk about. Because, well, exactly what I said. If you met Sandy and Jim now, you'd see no signs of the earthquake that unsettled their lives not that long ago. You probably wouldn't even see the cracks caused by the aftershock. But they're there. And if there's anything the Greys worry about now, it's how those cracks will spider into the future. Because they never really go away. And if they get big enough, you can fall in again. I try not to anticipate. I try to live this thing a day at a time. And, you know, when I start projecting out in the future, it gets, you know, it gets scary. You know, it gets really scary. So I try to keep it simple and just, you know, deal with what's going on. We've come to the, the realization that, you know, we're going to see the kids graduate. We're going to see the twins graduate, you know, in our home, which was not the, the plan. So now we're, we're talking 10 years from now. So, you know, fast forward 10 years. I'm going to be 10 years older, and (laughs) we both are. So um, part of that's exciting, you know, uh, know, because I I am looking forward to to retiring, and I think that would free up some time to spend with the the kids, but it's going to be different. Um, It's going to be very different. And I think of more like what that means in raising the two of them in today's day and time. You know, when Michael died, he was really more on the front end of this crisis that's going on. Um, So it was happening and several happened right around when he, he died, but a lot more has happened in the last six years. So that is very scary to me, you know, because we did not come out unscathed the first time and I do have two others that um, don't struggle with addiction, but of course struggle with the effects of addiction. So it's very scary for me to think about what's coming with the twins because they have so many, um, you know, I've made it my mission to kind of really learn a lot about opiates and it's, really the field that I work within now, Um, but kind of all aspects. And I don't know if you've ever heard of ACEs, um, Adverse Childhood Experiences. And it's kind of a scale that that people look at now as far as trying to predetermine what could be coming in later years when it comes to substance abuse and trauma and all that. And when you look at those... uh, things that are part of that ACEs, you know, 
these kids have several of them already, and they had them before they were five. You know, like losing a parent, um, you know, another parent being gone, um, substance abuse. I mean, there's just so many different things that already sets them up. Stacked where, against them. Stacked against them, where Michael really didn't have those things. And then the other side I think about is that I do have that experience of what happened with their dad to be able to kind of go with them um, and talk to about, you know, what that uh, journey looked like for him um, and being able to share similarities. But I, I don't fool myself in thinking, because I know better, that just because, you know, somebody has died from an overdose, that that's going to be enough that somebody else won't go down that road. I know that's not true. I see it all the time. Um, so I can't say to myself, well, my gosh, their dad died that way. They would never choose to use. Yeah, them, but never say never. Yeah. So those are the things I think about, but I don't allow myself to stay in that place because it would, um, what do I want to say? It would just kind of stop me and my paralyze It's paralyzing. It consumed and paralyzed you. The WREL Doc Podcast is a production of WREL Documentary, part of the Capital Broadcasting Podcast Network. This episode was written and produced by me, Cliff Bumgartner. Our theme music is by Lee Roservere and Breakmaster Cylinder. A heartfelt thanks to Sandy Taper Gray and Jim Gray for their time, openness, and honesty in talking with me. Again, if you want to hear more of Michael's story, as well as other stories of addiction and how people are fighting it, check out our documentary, Finding a Fix, available now on the WRAL Documentary YouTube page, where you can also find dozens of other docs, bonus content, and more. And lastly, if you enjoy the podcast, please give us a rating and subscribe on your podcast app of choice. Until next time, thanks for listening.